Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast, the show dedicated to inspiring God's people to study His Word. I'm your host, Adam Castellino. So, the first episode, I talked about Joseph and the silos and what we can learn from that in our own personal lives. I shared about being very careful about listening to certain voices in our media and our world because it spreads negativity and it could distract us from what the Lord wants for us. And I have a lot more that I'm excited to get into in the coming weeks and the coming episodes, the Lord willing. But for today, I just wanted to go over some of my thoughts about the plan of God. Now, the Bible says very clearly that it's the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. He created this entire universe. And he has a specific plan and destiny for everyone. And you could think about the global plan that God has for the entire world. Or you could think about the plan he has for your life. Because no matter who you are, whether you consider yourself an important, influential person in this world, or if you're just a normal, everyday guy like me, God has a special destiny and plan for you. The Bible says before you were even born, he knew you, and he was the one who knit you together in your mother's womb and has a plan for you. But what is that plan? You know, each one of us has a unique purpose in God, but the overall plan is for each one of us to know Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16 says, For in him, Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10 says this, Having made known to us the mystery of his, God's will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, which means throughout all history, God might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. So what Paul is saying in both of these passages is that everything that's been created exists for Jesus, which means for you and I, our real destiny, our real purpose in life is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Meaning, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with God through him, you're not going to fulfill your true destiny. You may have a good life, you may have a great job, a career, or, but your true destiny, the true reason you were created is, is for you to first know the one who created you. And Jesus said that if you see him, you see the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And here we see in Colossians and Ephesians, it's God's plan for all of us to be found in Christ, which means we truly become who we were meant to be when we know him. And not only that, but the entire universe, all things that were created, finds its true purpose in Jesus Christ. And so that when we put our faith in him, Jesus who rose from the dead, we will once again be reconciled back to God, our sins will be washed away, and now we will have a full relationship with our Heavenly Father. And in that place, we can fulfill God's destiny. Christ's redemption on the cross wasn't just about saving humanity. It was about restoring the entire creation back to what God had intended. So it's important to ask ourselves, how does God's plan actually come about? Something like this seems so important. Why doesn't he do it right away? Or why doesn't his plan for me happen right when I ask him? Some of you who know God and have walked with God for years or grew up in church and learned about God and learned about prayer, you might think, well, The Bible says, go and ask God for something and he'll answer your prayer. It's very important to pray and ask God. Jesus himself said, ask and you will find. So when I go to God in prayer asking him for something, why doesn't it happen right away? And it could be something good. This is not necessarily something that God doesn't want you to have. It might be a good thing. And if you look at this world and you see the Bible that says, one day Jesus will come back and judge all the wickedness and bring it to an end and restore the world and bring peace and justice. Why hasn't it happened yet? Why are we still in this world that seems so fallen? Why has it been so long? Well, we have to understand a very important dynamic about how God fulfills his plan. He doesn't do it all at once the way we would, might expect him to do. There's a process by which God fulfills his plan, both in our lives individually and in the entire world. If you study scripture, you see that example repeated again and again. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10, It says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And the idea coming across there, you could use the equivalent modern phrase, step by step, baby steps, little by little. It's a concept that God's plan and purpose 
takes steps. And we see throughout the life of the men and women of faith in the Bible, it never always happened right at once. Often the process was God appears to someone, he speaks to them, he gives them a promise or, or a calling, and then there's a time between that moment and the time that it's fulfilled. But the time in between wasn't some sort of delay. It wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't, you know, them messing up or them falling short. It was a part of the process that God was fulfilling his plan. And this is not something that should be very strange for us because even in our own natural life and in the natural world, we see that things take time to unfold. A baby doesn't pop right out of the womb right away the moment they're conceived. It's nine months of a slow, steady process starting out as a microscopic little fetus. And the baby grows. First they're the size of a peanut, then the size of an apple, then the size of a football. And then you see the development of the heart very early on. You hear the heart beating. And then the lungs form, and then the eyes, and the fingers, and the toes, and it's a process. And nine months later, out comes the baby. But it didn't happen all at once. And the same thing happens even in our own life. If you have a big project, think about that, that you want to do. Let's say you want to start a business or something big. You don't do it all at once. There are stages. A good example would be, let's say, the movie industry. When a studio wants to make a movie, they don't just do it immediately. There's actually stages. There's three main stages, pre-production, production, and post-production. In pre-production, they buy a script or hire someone to write a script, and then they pick the director and the producers, and then they cast the crew and the actors and get people making costumes and painting sets, and then they scout out locations, and then they plan things, and it gives time for the actors to memorize their lines. And then they enter the production stage, and this is sometimes the shortest stage, depending on the, the project, and everyone's shooting, and they're filming, and there's all these makeup artists, and hair, and all these people, and then it moves from that stage to post-production, where they hire really talented musicians to create the score of the movie, and then they have editors who cut the movie into, into proper pacing, and then they'll add the special effects and the CGI, and then finally, after all of that, they'll release the movie, and it could take up to two years for some movies, some movies even longer. And that's true if you're building a building or starting a business or anything that we do. If it's the bigger the project, in fact, the more planning and stages that need to take place. Because you can't rush it. You can't jump ahead and start shooting a movie before you even cast the actors. And you can't start editing the movie until you shoot the movie. So you see there's a logical process moving from one step to another in order to accomplish the ultimate goal. And if that's true for something like a movie or a business, how much more God, who's not just fulfilling little plans here and there, but he's got a divine plan for the entire world. In fact, Ephesians 1 verse 11, Paul writes, In him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose, hear this, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What's so amazing about God is he has this amazing divine ability that only he has, where he can orchestrate the events of the world to fulfill his plan. And what's so impressive, and only God can do this, no human, no angel, no demon, no company, no government can do this, but he can allow everything happening in the world throughout history to fulfill his plan. Even things that from our perspective look wrong. Even sin, even the acts of the devil, even moves made by ungodly people who don't believe in God. God can even use those things to fulfill his plan. Because God is above everything. He created this universe. He created time. And he appointed throughout the course of time what will happen, who will live where, who will be king over this country, who will be in charge of this, who will make money, who will lose a war. All of those things he knew ahead of time. And he orchestrated all of it to accomplish his ultimate will, which is reconciling the world back to himself through Jesus Christ. You might say, what about free will? What about all that? Yes, we have free will in that we can choose to be a part of God's plan through faith and obedience, or we can choose to go against his plan through disobedience and unbelief and sin and just get kind of mowed over, if you want to think about it that way. No one is going to thwart God's plan. You could kick and you could scream and you could rebel all you want, but it's not going to stop what God is doing. See, during Jesus' day, he raised up disciples who followed after him, who believed and knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't understand that it was God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross. They actually thought God's plan failed because the majority of the Jewish people rejected him and handed him over to the, the Romans and crucified him. They thought that was a, a fault of the plan. Somehow God screwed up or, or, or our evil unbelief got in the way. But when Jesus rose again on the third day, 
He himself told his disciples that was a part of God's plan. In the wonderful story in Luke chapter 24, where Jesus appears to the two disciples as they walk on the road to Emmaus, he says this in verse 25, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, how slow are your hearts to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was written in the scriptures about himself. So Jesus revealed to these disciples that it was God's plan for Christ to suffer. It was exactly God's plan. What they thought was a complete devastating mistake because of people's unbelief, that was a part of God's plan. And that's something that we can't fully grasp on our own because obviously the people who crucified Jesus, they did it out of sin and, and unbelief. Both the Jews and the Gentiles, they did a very evil thing when they nailed Jesus to the cross. And all of us are guilty of that because he, he bore all of our sin. But that was a part of God's plan. See, only God can do that. Only God can take the mistakes of this world and use it for God's good purpose. Romans chapter 8 verse 24 says, And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's a special promise for each one of us. Because you see, in Ephesians, Paul made it very clear that no matter what happens, God is going to work all things according to the counsel of his will. Meaning, no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens with an election or a war or this country or this government, or what these people do, or that those people do, everything is going to end up fulfilling God's plan for the earth. And it's all going to be culminated in the glorious return of Jesus Christ. But Paul gives a special promise to those of us who put our trust in the Lord that all things are going to work together for your good. All it takes is putting your trust in Jesus, and you will see all things in your life working for good. So, how does God actually fulfill his plan? What is that process? Well, it's important to understand it's in stages. It's important that it's step by step. In Acts chapter 13, Paul appears to a synagogue in a town called Pisidian Antioch, and he lays out a kind of summarized history of the people of Israel, culminating in the appearance of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 says, Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and began to speak. Men of Israel and you Gentiles who fear God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made them into a great people during their stay in Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he led them out of that land. He endured their conduct for about forty years in the wilderness, and having vanquished seven nations in Canaan, he gave their land to his people as an inheritance. All this took about four hundred and fifty years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and God gave them forty years under Saul, son of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin. After removing Saul, he raised up David as their king and testified about him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my will in its entirety. From the descendants of this man, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the arrival of Jesus, John preached the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his course, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not that one, but he is coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you Gentiles who fear God, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. And though they found no guilt for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had accompanied him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. Therefore let it be known to you, brothers, that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. You see, Paul is basically giving us an entire overview of the Old Testament and God's plan through Israel. But if you noticed in this message, he starts with the fathers, and then he turned them into a great people in Egypt, and then they were in the wilderness for 40 years, and then, and then they entered the promised land, that was about 450 years, and then there was the Samuel the prophet after the time of the judges, and then came the kings, and then came David, and then through David came the descendants that led to Jesus, who was the Savior. 
So you see that there was a very long, very intricate process that God was using to raise up Jesus. And we could study all the unique dynamics of why he did it, why he did it through Abraham, why he did it through Israel, what's the significance of the kingdom of Israel and each of these people and each of these roles. And that would take, you know, the rest of our lives since it's a big part of studying scripture. But the point that I want to communicate to you is that there are stages. There is, there is the fathers, then there is, and then there are the people growing in Egypt, and then they were in the wilderness, and then they entered the promised land. Then there was a time of judges, and then the time of Samuel the prophet. Then there were the kings, and then through those kings came Jesus. But before Jesus came, there was John the Baptist, who preached for his time, for his purpose. And then he says when David served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. So you see, each person in their generation has a purpose in God, that we only discover by faith in the Lord, according to his word. And there's a purpose behind it, a purpose for our benefit, because when we serve the Lord, that's the most blessed we could ever be, because we're receiving from God and sharing with others, and that's fulfilling our destiny, and God's love and his grace flood through us. But there's a larger purpose that God wants to do through us and through our country and through our communities, ultimately to bring all people to the knowledge of Jesus. But this one passage at the very least, reveals to us that God's plan comes in stages. But why is that so important for us to recognize? Well, in our own lives, there are things that we might want to do or want to become, and we believe that those things are from the Lord. If you know Jesus and you study his word and you have a relationship with him for any length of time, you will have things that God puts in your heart that you want to accomplish. Maybe it's a kind of ministry. Maybe it's to have a family or a business or just something in your life that you hope for, that you know God can fulfill, but it hasn't happened yet. And you might get discouraged and you might believe the lies of the enemy saying, this is not God's plan. He doesn't want it for you or that you messed up or you screwed up. But it's important to know that there's a purpose in everything and that there's a process that God uses to fulfill his plan. Just think of how important it is that Jesus came to save the world. His death and resurrection paid the price for every single one of us. But he didn't do it right away. He had a plan where he worked through Abraham. He raised up the fathers. He brought them to Egypt to grow into a mighty nation. He delivered them from Egypt, brought them through the wilderness into the promised land. He raised up kings. All of it is a part of God's plan. And we may not understand all the little details, but there is a purpose in everything. And if it's true for something as big as this, it's true for ourselves. There are things that God had put in my heart when I first came to know him when I was 15 years old. Some of it didn't come to pass until many years later. And there were times where I thought to myself, why hasn't this happened? Or why isn't God answering this prayer? And there were times, if I'm being perfectly honest, where I felt like I screwed up somehow, or I was being disobedient, God was punishing me, or it just wasn't part of God's plan, even though it was a a sincere desire in my heart. But you know what? And I continued to turn to the Lord and ask Him to answer my prayer. Because I learned, because of the grace of God, that He had a plan through it all. In certain areas, I needed to grow. I needed to mature. There were things I needed to learn. There were things I needed to unlearn. And through it all, not only was was my mind changing, but I was just growing into more of the person God wanted me to be. And when the time was right, things happened very quickly in, in many areas. And that's how it sometimes feels, that we wait and wait and wait, and then suddenly it happens. But we don't understand. It was like that whole process of waiting was God building up to the moment where he fulfilled his plan. So it's very important to understand just how God carries out his plan. And like I said, the minute details will be different for each person, depending on where you live or who you are, what his call is. But you have to know there is a process. It could take a few weeks, could take a few years. Ultimately, it'll take the rest of our lives to fulfill everything that God has for us, of course. But it's always going to be a step-by-step process, line upon line. Would you like to know why God does that, at least on our personal level? It's because when God gives us a desire or a vision for our lives, we're not always ready for it to happen right away. We talked about Joseph in my first podcast about how God gave him a vision early on about his life, but it was many, many more years before that vision came about. Years of intense hardship for Joseph. He was betrayed by his brothers. They wanted to kill him. Instead, they sold him into slavery. He was a slave, wrongfully accused. He was thrown into prison. And only after all that time, God raised him up 
to be the person he called him to be. But you have to understand, all those years before that were a part of the process. Joseph was not ready to be the leader that God called him to be when he was a young man having those dreams. It just wasn't time yet. So God brought him through these difficult things. See, God wasn't the one who actually did the bad things to Joseph. And that can be difficult for us to understand because as humans, we, we sometimes think of things as black and white, yes or no. If this was part of God's plan, then he was the one behind it. No, Joseph's brothers were wrong to do what they did. Okay, Potiphar's wife was wrong to wrongfully accuse him. All these people were sinning in their attacks against Joseph, who did nothing wrong in these cases. But God still used it as a part of his divine plan to position Joseph strategically to save Egypt and to reconcile his family and to save them from the famine and all those things. And so there's kind of like this old-fashioned religious idea that some people have in church where they think they're being reverent to God by saying, Oh God, this plague which you have sent, this challenge, this trouble which you have sent. And it's like you're blaming God for things he has nothing to do with. Okay? God is a good God. Every good and perfect gift, James says, comes from the Father above, the Father of the heavenly lights. He's a God of grace who loved us so much he sent Jesus to deliver us from our sin. So the bad things that happen in this life, they're not from God, but God, through his divine purpose, can use those things to fulfill his destiny in us. And a big part of that is causing us to be humble, to rely solely on him, so that we can mature into the men and women of God that he's called us to be. We need to understand that more than fulfilling what we want for ourselves, God wants to change us into the people he, he's called us to be. He wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. He wants us to be unshakable people so that when trials in this world come, we will not be shaken because our lives are built on the rock, Jesus. And that brings us to a place of humility and wisdom that we're ready for the thing that we wanted, that we, we asked God for, or that, or that vision or desire that he put in our hearts. And that it goes from one step to another. Nothing's by mistake. Nothing is random. Nothing's accidental. It's all been a part of God's perfect purpose to accomplish in us and in the world. So keep this in mind as you study God's word and as you meditate on the word and pray about your life and about what you see in the world and what God is teaching you. It's a process. And have faith and trust that God will fulfill that process. Nothing's going to stop that from happening. As long as you submit and trust in the Lord, he will accomplish that good purpose in you. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. All our episodes are available on Spotify and Apple Podcast. And you could listen to every episode and look, read articles and other content on lightningpodcast.org. See you next time.